Oxfam works with women around the world and men living in poverty working at the bottom of these supply chains. I've given you an example of women in Myanmar who earn $4 a day, who work seven days a week, who don't get paid when they are sick, who get fired when they are pregnant, and who have no rights, no voice at work. So companies have been able to keep wages down, lower them, they've been on a race to the bottom, while maximizing for people at the top. That is what happens. Then another thing is that the same companies have worked the rules, the global rules, to such an extent that they are able to ship out their profits untaxed. So they've denied governments, both in the South and the North, the revenue that they need. They don't pay their fair share of taxes, so they don't carry the burden that they should carry. So there's no money, not enough money, to plow back into education, into health, into social protection. And so people at the bottom suffer twice. They get taxed through indirect consumer taxes like we have in Africa, because the big companies have not been taxed corporation tax. And then they are denied services, which would help them to go into the market and be productive. So these are the causes of this, and so we know the solutions too, but the solutions have to be radical. It's about reconstructing business and recapturing politics so that public policies work for, for poor people. My name is Winnie Bianyema, and I'm the executive director of Oxfam International. Well, Africa has had like two decades of growth some of the fastest growing countries in the world have been African countries, and that was driven by the commodity boom, the high prices for Africa's natural resources, and also by foreign direct investment. But now we are seeing growth slowing, slowing because the demand from China, the appetite for Africa's natural resources has declined, and also from the other emerging countries that buy from Africa. But this growth that Africa has had didn't benefit the majority of African people. It was captured by these global companies with the connivance of the political leaders. So a lot of this wealth has been shipped out untaxed. One third of wealthy Africans' money is sitting offshore untaxed, and that's about $500 billion. If it was taxed, it would give Africa $16 billion every year. That's enough money to pay for the health of 4 million children, as well as to put a teacher in every classroom so that all African children can go to school. That's how much we are denied from just one tax loophole. So African leaders need to work on key issues to do with reforming the global system. They should stand together to stop this race to the bottom on taxation by companies. Companies play them and push them to lower and lower taxes to give them tax breaks and all that. They can take a line together. They can also push for global corporate tax reform because you need some global cooperation on corporate tax in order to rein in these companies. They can increase transparency of flaws. Some countries have made laws that actually increase transparency of resource flaws. And then they can channel the resource they capture into sectors where our young people can have jobs. We are the youngest continent in the world. 2025, half our population will be below the age of 25. These are people who can drive prosperity because they'll be well educated but they can also cause instability. It can explode if they are going to go to hopelessness and unemployment. So there are challenges about standing together to call for global reforms, standing together to face off companies so that they collect the revenue they need, and plowing money back into agriculture, into health, into education, into building the capacity of these young people for a future that is more knowledge-driven. The pathways to development for Africa won't be the old one. 
with automation, we're going to see that Africa will need to find a way to frog leap from rural agrarian economy to a more knowledge-driven economy. And that means putting more money into education, health of, of people, and investing in sectors that will bring jobs. Of course, climate change is a result of this economic model that is unjust, that is rigged against the poor. It is the high consumption of people in rich countries that has resulted in carbon emissions that are creating global warming. I've calculated that my uncle, who is a peasant in Uganda, would need to emit carbon for 198 years to emit the same carbon as an American in New York. So that's how unjust it is that those who have not caused climate change are already suffering the impacts that you're asking about. The weather that is no longer predictable, you get floods, and after the floods you get drought, after the drought it is floods, so you never get good harvests. So farmers are constantly at risk losing crop and have no insurance. They have no insurance, whereas those who live in rich countries can insure themselves from climate shocks. Those are the issues. But now, what we are seeing is that to move on to a low carbon path, these countries will need more money, more resources and technology. This should have been secured through the Paris Agreement. And there were some commitments to, uh, towards adaptation finance. But we track this money, Oxfam tracks this money, and we see that the money for mitigation is increasing, while the money for adaptation is lagging behind. The Green Climate Fund is supposed to be 50% for adaptation, 50% for mitigation. The mitigation amount is up there, the adaptation money is down here. So again, you see a lack of commitment from those who cause climate change to support those who didn't cause it but are suffering the impacts. But yet, leadership is there. We are seeing innovation coming from the developing countries. India is moving very fast on solar. So is South Africa. I think South African companies are amongst the leading companies in innovating and the use of solar energy. We're seeing China doing so much to move itself away from dirty fuels towards a green path. We're seeing developing countries committing to emission targets beyond their fair share through their nationally determined contributions. We are seeing the richest and the one who caused it most walking away from the Paris Agreement. So, in fact, we are seeing leadership from developing countries on this question. And, and as for women, yeah, it places a severe burden, particularly in Africa and in, in South Asia, where women are the main providers of food and dominating the food sector in agriculture. They are unable to feed their families. They have to work harder to put food on the table for their children. They have to care for sick people who are not necessarily sick because of climate change, but because of the pressure on the government budgets, there's less care coming from the state. So women have to put in more time for care. In times of disasters, women often are the last to be informed and to know what to do to protect themselves. Their mobility is more constrained. So there are gender dimensions to this problem of climate change, particularly in the poorest countries. And uh, again, you see women standing up and leading. They are leading in community resilience efforts. They are leading in uh, reconstructing their homes and their communities after extreme weather events like floods, like droughts. So. Yeah, women are heroes of climate change, heroines of climate change, and resources should be channeled to them to support their leadership. There was a Supreme Court justice in America called Louis Brandeis. He once said that you can have democracy 
and you can have wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but you can't have both. We are experiencing extreme levels of inequality that are presenting a choice to our leaders, either to reduce inequality and have democracy, or to forego democracy and allow extreme inequality. And I'm afraid politicians everywhere are choosing inequality, supporting companies to maximize for themselves, and then suppressing people because people want to rise against this injustice of inequality. So my message to young people, particularly to women's organizations, to youth organizations, is that we are under attack all over the world. Our space, citizen space for engagement, for fighting back, for questioning public policies is becoming smaller and smaller because our leaders are choosing to be in a cozy bed with the rich and, and to ignore our voices. But we have to fight back. We have to organize, we have to claim back our democracies, and then tackle the issue of a global economy that's rigged against the majority. We can do it.